Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Growing Deeper podcast, where I'll be talking about the book of John today. Just wanted to say welcome. Today we'll look at the book of John chapter 1 from verse 43 or verses 43 to 51, as well as chapter 2. Thank you for taking time to join us and we will begin shortly. From John 1, 43 to 51, we're told that the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, and Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I have said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Quickly, these are a few notes I just want to mention with regards to this section, and then we'll take some comments. One of the things that is interesting is that when Jesus calls these people, right, we see that the first set of disciples followed him. And then when he called Philip, and then uh, uh, when, when, when Philip came along, right, Jesus said, follow me. And he just followed, right? So when Jesus called, they just followed. In following him, there's a level of commitment that had to be established. People were willing to be committed in following Jesus. One of the challenges today, I believe, is that commitment is lacking in many levels of society. And there's a reason for some of that. Part of that is because maybe some people have failed some people or maybe governments or whatever have failed people. And so people begin to distrust. And when you don't trust, you don't commit to somebody. Now, in regards to practical life lessons, we need to see that we are committed in our friendships to people that we say we're friends to. If I say I'm a friend to somebody, then I need to be willing to be committed to put in the effort. And the same thing applies when we deal with commitments with uh, other things we see. This happens in marriage. And sometimes people don't want to get married because they're afraid of commitment, right? That's a big thing people used to say. Oh, I'm afraid of commitment. Commitment is something that we should be willing to do when it is called for, rather than having no commitments at all, right? We see a lot of young people who don't want to have any commitment to the church or the body of Christ. I don't want to have any commitment to anybody. Well, we have to reanalyze that, commi- reanalyze that premise. Commitment has its place. So Jesus called Philip, and Philip followed him. And then we see that, of course, we heard earlier when Jesus met Peter and Andrew. But the Nathaniel guy, that's where it gets interesting. Because when it was told that they found the one, Jesus, you know, the one, uh, the son of Joseph, it's interesting that Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Here's what's interesting, though. When Jesus meets Nathanael, what do you notice he says about him? He said, this is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. That is interesting because notice that Nathanael had just said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then Jesus is saying, this guy is a good guy, essentially. So that tells us that Nathanael, when he said that, did not say it out of a bad heart. He didn't say it out of a bad heart. Uh, He he wasn't, he he was, in a sense, one preacher said he was almost joking as he said it. So humor is not always a bad thing. And so Nathaniel was not scolded, in a sense, for what he said initially, which is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, of course, we know that good things can come out of Nazareth. Um, No matter where, and and I think that one of the prophets, you see, it is interesting because now you're connected to the prophet. One of the prophets, prophet Micah, also made a comment about that, which was partly in a prophecy to Jesus coming. But again, oh, from this Bethlehem, from a small town, or from a small place, I should say, something is going to come forth. And other prophets talk about these uh, different prophecies about Jesus. But it's interesting to see, as far as a life lesson, it doesn't matter, right? The, the, the beginning doesn't matter as much as the end of the story. Where you come from is not the end of the story. And it's encouraging to see how God can use different people's situations, even when they come from certain places that other people might think, no, nothing good can come out of there. 
But in Jesus' case, of course, we know a lot of good came out of Nazareth. So Jesus says, you know, basically, um, this is an Israelite indeed in whom there's no guile. The other word used for guile is deceit. You know, somebody who there's no deceit in. Part of my goal and my prayer, and I hope is the same for all of us, is to seek to be people without deceit. Now, nobody's perfect, but we can grow and we can keep seeking to... Um, Apply ourselves to grow in integrity, to grow in honesty, to grow in wisdom, and so on and so forth. But Nathaniel here we see is an example. But even though Nathaniel was, was commended as an Israelite with no deceit, we also see that he, he had more to learn. He had more to accomplish. His story was not over. Because Jesus tells him, right, after he says, uh, before Philip called you, oh, sorry, let's go back. He says, how do you know me? Well, that's interesting that he asked that question, right? Sometimes if people say things about us, we might just either assume that what they're saying is not valid or this or that. But Nathaniel knew, well, this guy's right. For whatever reason, Nathaniel was doing some things well in his life. And Jesus said that of him. And he said, how do you know me? Notice Jesus had only said one thing about him. And he says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So Nathaniel answered and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. So everybody has to come to a place where they recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and he is the King of Kings. Now Jesus reminded him that he will see greater things than what he has seen. And that is amazing again, that Jesus is able to walk with people where they're at, but also to call them to a higher place that they need to get to. To realize, hey, Nathaniel, there's more that you will see. Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, of course, this was also described in the book of Genesis with Jacob, where he had that happen. And Jacob had some guile. We know that. He had some guile, but God worked through him still. Jacob lied, as we know, with the story. He lied and he got his brother's blessings. Uh, But again, that's another life lesson for us to quickly digest. No matter where we've come from, no matter what our story, God is able to work in and through us to accomplish his purposes. So quickly, and then I'll stop. A few questions and thoughts. Number one, the disciples were regular people with regular jobs and families. And Jesus, again, placed a call on their lives. And when he said, follow me, they followed. God calls us, even if we're regular, to be involved in expanding his kingdom, to be involved in lifting high his name. Number two, they they started following him and then they got transformed. Truth, by its nature, will transform us. If we know the truth, it changes how we think. And if we change how we think, it will change how we act. So truth transforms. And Jesus gives us clarity here as he, as he begins to call them, and then we begin to see their lives change. Notice that when they come in contact with Jesus, they say things to the effect of, wow, you're the one. And then they start following him, and they're committed. Zacchaeus, if you remember his story, when he met Jesus, short Zacchaeus, the tax collector, again, he also, when he met Jesus, said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop the things I was doing that were wrong, and this and that. So when people know Jesus, then it should affect how they live. It should affect how I live my life when I start following Jesus. My life ought to change. And that's one of the challenges, I think, today in, in, um, in just a world of dialogue and debates is that some people want to eat their cake and have it. That's the way they say it. Basically, I want to say I'm a Christian, but I don't want to do what a Christian ought to do. Well, how does that make sense? The word Christian is not a compliment. And I think that's the problem. Some people don't understand When somebody says, when I tell someone, oh, are you a Christian? I'm not giving them a compliment. I'm asking a question of a statement of fact. If I tell someone, oh, from what I gather, you're not a Christian. I didn't insult them. I'm just going based on the data they've given me. So that means that Christianity has to have a definition. Otherwise, we don't have any truth. So let's step step into apologetics before we take our first round of comments and questions. C.S. Lewis, the author from uh, England, once said, If somebody is a bachelor, that means that they're not married. The moment you say bachelor, you're implying an unmarried man. However, people are trying to say, I want to be anything I want to be, including being a married man, calling myself a bachelor. That's actually the equivalent of what people are doing today. They want to dissolve the definition of a word and not allow the word have meaning. Well, that's a problem because the word means unmarried man. So I say all of that to say this. I don't know, right? I, nobody can condemn anybody. That's not the call. Nobody, no human being can condemn anybody. But what human beings can do is they can make judgments based on information they have. 
So if I have information and somebody says, I don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, I don't believe that Jesus existed, etc., etc., well, such a person cannot then say, oh, and I'm a Christian, but I don't believe any of that. Well, what, what is a Christian if you don't believe what Christians believe? This is critical because we live in a day where truth has been assassinated, honestly, which is very sad. What I mean by that is truth in many ways, is being downgraded. People don't take truth uh, uh, um, as seriously. People don't take the definitions of things seriously. So we need to come in love to encourage people to recognize, you know, you can be or choose to say things about this and that, but if your facts don't line up with definition, then what you've said is not true. And so that's one of the things that we see when Jesus calls people, their lives get transformed. That's just a part of the package. It's just part of it. Uh, when we come to Jesus, our lives get transformed. So we need to stick to truth. We need to go with what a word means rather than changing it to fit what we want it to mean. So are there specific areas that people change as they come to know Jesus? I believe that there's areas that we, we might see change begin to happen. The goal in Christianity is not simply, I'm, I'm a Christian, everything is perfect, everything is true. I mean, everything is perfect in my life. No, there's an element of growth. I keep growing. I'm growing towards perfection. I don't settle where, for where I'm at. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 3. So when Jesus calls these disciples, they're going to start changing. Something is going to start happening in their lives. Number two, we need to then in, in, inspect our lives and see how am I growing in my walk with Jesus. If I became a doctor and I never ever became better as a doctor... I would personally not think my patients would want to see me, right? Imagine I become a doctor the first year of my doctorship. I'm, I'm just doing terrible. I mean, I, I can't listen to my patients. I can't do what I need to do. Well, if I stay that way over the years, that's not going to be good. However, what if I become a doctor and the first year I'm not as good, but the second year I learn from my mistakes and now I'm doing better as a doctor and so on and so forth. More and more people will be more willing to listen because they realize this guy is growing. This doctor is growing. As Christians, we're not going to figure it all out on day one. But we need to be growing. And that's the key. The disciples grow. And that's a big part. And finally, how much time do we invest in seeking to grow closer to God? Because there's always opportunities to grow. If something matters to us, then it should affect our attitude in wanting to grow. If I want to become a better mathematician, I make time to seek to grow you know, to grow in the math and so on and so forth. And it actually says this right in the Bible in Hebrews 5 and 6. It says that there's an exercising that should happen in our lives. And that exercising helps us to discern good and evil. So all of that to say, when Jesus called his disciples, it affected things in a mighty way. Their lives began to change. And our lives also need to change as we come in contact with knowing Jesus. Finally, I've heard stories of people who have said that they don't believe in Christianity because of some of the uh, hypocrisy of Christians. Oh, I don't believe because I've seen other Christians and how they act. Well, it is important to note that even Jesus was against hypocrisy. I find that very interesting. Even Jesus was against hypocrisy. So what we need to tell people is, okay, sorry, maybe you've noticed that I'm not uh, as solid of a Christian as what you think I should be. But here's Jesus. I'm following after him and I'm calling you to join me in following Jesus. It's Jesus we're following. Uh, No human being again will be perfect, but we all need to seek to grow and become more like Jesus, which is what it says in 1 Corinthians 3 and also in the book of Romans. The goal is becoming like Jesus. So essentially Christianity as a summary is about becoming like Jesus. It's about repenting. It's about changing and becoming like Jesus. Nobody is telling others, hey, you need to change today and have everything perfect, and then I'll call you a Christian. No, a Christian is one who is becoming like Jesus, who is growing, who is seeking after perfection for the glory of God. So we need to call people to follow Jesus and remind them that he is the one that, is th- that we follow. Not another man, not another woman, but Jesus Christ is the one that we follow. So Jesus called his disciples, and that brings us to the end of chapter 1. Questions, thoughts, and comments, please.